ooh, I'll have one of these, and one of these, and one of those, and, uh, how about one of those? Excellent! And how will you be paying for that? Um, how about by being the savior of this town, so I should get this for free? Ooh, sorry, we don't have a discount for that. I'll, um, be back later. Ladies, gentlemen, and hunters of all ages with Wild Hearts finally releasing, players everywhere are starting to dive into this game properly. And what you may realize sooner rather than later is that the game isn't actually that easy. Of course, the very early creatures are a bit forgiving, but as you progress through the game, you'll realize that compared to your health bar, the Kimono actually do quite a significant amount of damage. And as a result, you may find yourself sitting there thinking, how on earth can I do this? How can I get past my current challenge aside from literally just dodging attacks better? Well, there are a couple of more basic tips that I can give you. Things like eat food for the maximum health boot that they can give you, if nothing else, or maybe you should be using carrot curry more often as it helps quite a bit with most fights. But there is one undeniable part of a game like this that makes your experience wildly different depending on how much respect you give it. Weapons and armor, specifically the time and effort that you spend upgrading your weapons and armor, and also the choices that you make while doing so. On a base level, the more defense that you have, the less damage you'll take from attacks. And the more attack that you have, the shorter your hunts will be, the more flinches you'll get, and as a result, you simply won't be in danger quite as long or as frequently. But there is a lot more to it than just that, specifically mostly around skills. So first up, I'll go into a basic explanation of how armor and weapon skills work in Wild Hearts, then we'll dive into my best recommendations of armor and weapons for progression through the story. Of course, once we reach the proper late game, you'll probably want to make a proper build of your own, something specific to your own weapon. But these are some really strong all-rounder concepts that will make your experience getting to that point way, way easier regardless of your weapon of choice. Starting off then, let's talk quickly about about armor skills. All pieces of armor in the game have their own defense number, their own resistance values, and also a unique modifier in the top right corner that is referred to as human path points if it's blue, or kimono path points if it's red. This is important when it comes to skills. Most armor pieces have skills, and there are various types of skills within the game. Some affect your health, your defense, your damage, your stamina, or even more specific things than that. Generally speaking, armor will just have these skills that they have, but some armor has skills with these symbols on it. Light blue and purple symbols refer to human path skills, and these two shades of red refer to kimono path skills. These skills will only be active if you have enough human points or kimono points, and as you can see from the bar at the bottom of the equipment screen, you can only lean into one of these sides at a time, so you have to choose which one you want to aim towards based on the skills that you want to activate. Most armor pieces also have a human version that has higher defense and also gives you extra human points, or a kimono version that has higher defense and gives you extra kimono points. This is how you craft your armor set perfectly. Aside from this, skills are relatively straightforward. Then, also, there are the weapons, and most weapons in Wild Hearts also have skills on them. There are multiple upgrade trees in the game, and the one that you choose has a lasting effect on your end weapon, but can be undone without losing materials. You only cost gold. There are two types of weapon skills in the game, Inherent and Inherited. An Inherited skill is able to be brought with you as you upgrade your weapon. Every weapon has a set number of Inherited skill slots, and you can bring an Inherited skill with you all the way from the first weapon on the tree all the way to the weapon at the bottom if you choose to. For example, look at this one, full of inherited skills. The other type of skill is inherent. These are the skills that are locked to each specific weapon along the way. You cannot move these further through the path with you. They are stuck on the weapon that they're on. What this means is as far as an endgame weapon, you want to take the path that offers you the best inherited skills along the way and eventually ends on the weapon with the best mix of inherent skills and also offensive stats. It is relatively complex, but it's really Really cool once you adjust to the concept. So with that said, what are the sort of easy mode choices here? What are the ideal early and mid game armor and weapons? At this point it's worth mentioning that the game is sort of split up into two sections. The story is presented in chapters, and the game in chapter 1 and 2 is notably different from the game in chapter 3 onwards. Split. Down the middle. Specifically, this affects armor and weapons as well, as every kimono gets a second armor set defined by this breakpoint, and the weapon tree sort of splits in the middle, letting you go sideways to connect to any future tree that you wish. Well, as far as the weapons go then, this is actually quite simple. As a warning, there will be some slight spoilers from here on out, it's just impossible not to tell you what a weapon comes from and still expect you to be able to find it and understand what I'm saying. So then, for the actual progression of the game, skills do matter, but more than anything, you just want the highest raw damage weapon that you can make. Element isn't used 
useless, but a raw weapon will make you just as effective against every single kimono, rather than elements which specialize on certain enemies. So for general progression, if you just want an efficient way through the game without having to farm a whole load, a raw weapon is going to be the best answer. That said, the best raw weapon for every weapon type available before Chapter 3 is right here, and it's from a fellow called Ice Tusk. The easiest way to get here is the direct path from the starter weapon, which goes through Rage Tail, Rage Tail again, then Sap Scourge. A bunch of early easy kimono materials, and it won't take you much effort to farm. For the most part, this weapon also has a different physical damage type than is standard for your weapon type, which is fun. For example, Maul is typically a pommel weapon, but the Ice Tusk Maul is a lunging weapon. The skills on the weapon aren't great, but again, for actual progression, the raw attack of the weapon matters far more than the skills that you actually have on it. We can worry about your skills when we're going for proper builds, but to get to the end of the story with minimal farming, you just want pure attack. After this, we reach the mid-game point. You can see the line here where everything connects. Continuing with the same ideals, we actually want to aim for the exact same thing, really, which is the next rank of the raw attack Ice Tusk weapon. To go from our first one, you go here, which is mining materials. Demon Rock specifically is from the snow map in Chapter 3 onwards. Everything else is just a basic material you can get on every map. Then we go over to the King Tusk weapon. You'll need to fight him in Chapter 3 to get the materials needed for this. Then from here, we get to take this big leap down the diagonal line, skipping a bunch of farm at the end to get to the Ice Tusk weapon. Again, this doesn't give you great weapon skills, but it does give you a ton of offensive power for absolutely minimal farm. I got to the end of the story with one of these weapons, and it felt downright comfortable once I got this step. Now to move on to the armor then, starting off, we have the early game set, which I recommend you keep until, again, chapter 3 of the story. I can hardly wait for chapter 3. To begin with then, I've devised these mix sets with the idea of them both having good skills that will benefit you quite a bit in the chances of actually making it through stuff, but also not being a pain in the butt to farm, so keep that in mind. That said, your helmet will be the one made from Spine Glider and Dreadclaw materials. This has recovery boost 15%, which simply increases the amount of health you recover from any source by 15%. The chest is the one made from a mix of Rage Tail and Sap Scourge materials, which has the health boost plus 3 skill, increasing your maximum health a fair bit to help with the bigger hits that you'll take. The arms are the ones made from Spine Glider and Dreadclaw again, and these have Savage plus 1, which is simply a small boost to your attack stat. If stamina is more important to your weapon, and you'll know if it is quite quickly, an alternate recommendation that I have here is the Gold Shard Spore Tail Arms, which you get a little bit later, which have the Dodge Master skill at 17%, which reduces the stamina cost of dodging. For your leg slot, I'd recommend Grit Dog if you are using a weapon that cares more about stamina. This has the Core Boost skill at 10% for a straight up 10% boost to your maximum stamina. Otherwise, I'd recommend the Autumn Set Legs, which you get from materials found on the third map once you've unlocked it. These have the Nimble Fingered skill at 16%, which simply means that you'll be drinking healing water 16% faster with these equipped. Then finally, for your foot slot, I recommend the Spine Glider Dreadclaw set once again, as this has the Recovery Boost 15% skill once again, which does stack with the same skill that you have on the helmet. This set should be able to get you all the way to Chapter 3 with minimal issues, though if you do feel like you need a little bit of intermediary power boost to get to the next armor set, I'd recommend both the Death Stalker chest and arms. The chest has Health Boost plus 3, which is the same as our original chest, but notably higher defense numbers, and the arms have Ironclad 1, which is a small defense boost, as well as Dodge Boost 2, which increases the iframes on dodging maneuvers. Then we move on to the armor set to farm once you've reached Chapter 3. The head will be Chapter 3 King Tusk, which we kill again as soon as you reach Chapter 3. And this is a notable defense boost, as well as having the Strong Arm Water plus 3 skill and the Nostrum Water skill. We won't be activating the second one, so it doesn't really matter what it does, but we will be activating the first one, which gives you 3 healing water back every time you use the Hunter's Arm mechanic. As well, we will be crafting the Human Path version of this helmet in order to give us the required points to activate said skill. For the chest slot, you'll want the Chapter 3 Rage Tail and Sap Scourge piece once again, which has health boost plus 5. For the arm, you want the Chapter 3 King Tusk again, this one giving you health boost plus 5 again, and also Strong Arm Remedy plus 33. This restores exactly 33 health whenever you do Hunter's Arm, which is generally close to one third of your health bar. For your legs, you want the Chapter 3 Rage Tail and Sap Scourge piece once again, which gives you health boost plus 5, as well as dodge boost plus 4, again, increasing your iframes for dodging action 
actions. Then finally, we want the Chapter 3 King Tusk Legs for Savage plus 3, which is just a bit of an attack boost and another health boost plus 5. All of this is farmed from really easy kimono. It's literally from three different fights that are considered the earliest in the game, and again, the earliest in Chapter 3. The actual boost that you get from these pieces, though, is really quite notable, making it much more comfortable to fight your way to the end of the story. If, again, you feel the need to upgrade a touch more before you actually reach the end, the Chapter 3 Deathstalker chest piece is the way to go here. Having that same health boost plus 5 skill, but also boasting higher defense numbers and having ironclad plus 3 and stowed weapon art 25%, which makes you sheath your weapon 25% faster than you would otherwise. And that's it, everyone. An easy to farm weapon and armor path that can comfortably take you to the end of the story. If you do this, especially for the weapon, you may well miss out on some cool changes that you can make to your weapon to actually have it perform a bit differently, but if your goal is to unlock everything as fast as possible so you can plan out your proper build, this is absolutely the most efficient and effective way that I've seen to do it. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I hope it helps you out if you're struggling at all, or even just if you're interested. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye